Welcome to Face Forward, the inspiring change podcast on all things internal communications, engagement, leadership, and change. Hello there, and welcome to this episode of the Inspiring Change podcast. I was really lucky um, to be able to attend an interesting seminar a couple of weeks ago, which Nick Morgan, author, coach, and communications uh, speaker, launched his new book, Can You Hear Me? How to Connect with People in a Virtual World. And as I often do when I when I've been to seminars like this, I went off and I bought the book. Um, but rather than putting the book onto the shelf, which I believe is known as shelf development as opposed to self development, um, I actually read it. I actually read the book. Um, I was on a trip and I, I brought it with me on the plane. And there were a couple of paragraphs that really struck me. Um, and I'm going to read them out to you. Um, first one was as we've made room for virtual communication in our lives, our workplaces, and in all the ways we connect with one another. We haven't fully realized how emotionally empty virtual communications are. Every form of virtual communication strips out the emotional subtext of our communications to a greater or a lesser extent. And there was another one that struck me as well about virtual relationships, that they're more fragile and easily disrupted because they lack the unconscious connections that our face-to-face interactions automatically convey. The lift of an eyebrow, the tone of a voice, a quick smile. And of course, this got me thinking, in the context of internal communications and engagement, the impact of this, this new obsession of, 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 of communicating digitally. You know, we're very quick to turn to email and, and video communication and telephone conferences. But what impact must that be really having on levels of employee engagement and your ability as people to work as internal communicators in organizations to really communicate with your people? So it's great and very slightly ironic given the conversation is about the lack of communication in electronic communications, it's a little ironic to have Nick on the show today from Boston uh, via Zoom um, to talk to me about his book, and particularly around the five problems with digital communications and how as communicators, um, people like you, the listeners, can start to overcome those issues. And we might talk to Nick briefly about nomophobia too, um, which was a new one on me. We'll come to that in a while. Nick, uh, good morning. How are you? I'm great, Scott. Thanks for having me on your podcast. I'm looking forward to the conversation. You're, you're more than welcome. Thanks a million for coming on. And particularly as you just moved house, I'm sure you're up to your neck in, uh, in packing cases. Um, so thanks for taking the time. Um, let's kick off with a, a really simple one. Um, maybe give us a bit about you and your background, where you've come from, first of all. Well, I first uh, leapt um, into the uh, public the public speaking world and the communications world um, when I got a call from the state secretary of education in Virginia. Um, and he said to me, uh, he was an old friend of mine, Morgan, how would you like to put that academic, uh, I was in the, uh, at the University of Virginia teaching, uh, how would you like to put that academic um, BS, that was the phrase he used, uh, to the test in the real world, writing speeches for the governor of Virginia. And he knew I couldn't resist a challenge like that. What I should have asked was, well, why has the previous speechwriter quit? And it turned out he'd had a nervous breakdown um, from overwork. Uh, And I I proceeded to spend the next two years writing five speeches a day um, for uh, seven days a week for two years. So it was a great introduction. Um, And that's how I really got involved uh, in, in thinking about practical communications. I got pulled out of the academic world where I'd been happily teaching Shakespeare and rhetoric um, and got brought into the, the uh, hurly burly of, of real life communications, trying to create speeches that connect with people, um, trying to uh, understand your constituencies and all those sort of uh, issues. Uh, So that's how I got started. Um, I, uh, uh, did crawl back into the academic world briefly after that uh, for a little rest and relaxation, uh, but uh, I, the, the allure of the of the uh, public communication world called me back, and and um, twenty years ago I founded my own consulting business, and I'm still running it. Okay, very good. I'm who, who are some of the people? Who are some of the companies that you'd have you'd have written for and worked with? Well, virtually all the Fortune fifty. Um, a number of heads of state, um, most of which I'm not allowed to mention. Um, uh, I worked for uh, various uh, governors and senators in the United States. Um, haven't worked for the president, uh, 
not the current president. Um, and, um, uh, and, and I've worked uh, for a number of professional speakers. That's a world which your viewers may or may or listeners may or may not be familiar with. But uh, um, those folks that, that when you go to a conference, somebody gives the keynote speech and, and you think I could have done that just as well as they did. Well, I'm the guy that coached them to, to get that speech and, and get paid the huge sum of money they got to do that. Okay, it's the likes of Keith Ferrazzi and those kind of people. Exactly. Do you know Keith? Yeah, well, yeah. you should know Keith. He's the world's greatest networker, right? So uh, yeah, Absolutely. Yeah, he knows yeah. everyone, and everyone knows yeah. him. Yes. <laughs> so tell me, listen, we're going we're gonna to talk a little bit about your new book, um, Can You Hear Me? How to Connect with People in a Virtual World. Why, why did you write it? Why did you feel the need to put pen to paper on this one? The immediate practical reason was that as I went around the world talking about body language, which was uh, the favorite subject that people asked me about, more and more in the last few years, people started to ask the question, well, this body language stuff is really interesting, Nick. Thanks for that. But I uh, lead a team of people in my business, and we're all virtual. We don't see each other's face-to-face. Um, and so as a result, um, how do I communicate with those people? How do I handle uh, the body language uh, information that isn't apparently getting through? So um, uh, it's a, um, it was an issue that kept coming up, and I thought, you know, there's enough interest here. I better write a book about it. Hmm. Now, this isn't your first book, obviously. I know I've written, um, I think that was the fourth. Yes, that's the fourth. My first one was uh, Give Your Speech, Change the World, which was about uh, um, the practical considerations of how to co- uh, construct a speech, uh, how to put one together, the content. And then um, more recently, Power Cues, which was about the neuroscience of giving a speech and how to show up with intent. Um, and, and now this one. I'm skipping over a couple in the middle there that needn't trouble us now. Okay. Okay, so let's cut back to Can You Hear Me? I mean, I, I went to the seminar um, down in Mason Hayden Curran there a couple of weeks back, uh, and you spoke through the, the five challenges. In the context of, of, of internal communications and engagement and leadership particularly, maybe bring us through what those five challenges are one at a time, and perhaps give us a bit of insight into how the listeners can, can they mitigate against them. Yeah, absolutely. So... The uh, first problem that I ran into as I began the research, um, and it's the one that uh, really drives all the others, that it causes all the others, uh, and that's the lack of feedback. So as you alluded to, uh, <clears throat> in the virtual world, the, the way we're speaking now, for example, uh, but in the way most people interact now in, in their business lives, at least half the time, and when I ask audiences about this, face-to-face audiences, um, Everybody raises their hand. Everybody, for example, has uh, a weekly audio conference with their team. Um, and it's typically replaced a face-to-face meeting. Um, and so when you think about it, the basic nuts and bolts, the glue that holds a team together is now communicated virtually. Oh. Well, that, um, that leads to the first big problem, which is the lack of feedback. Each one of the virtual communication substitutes for face-to-face communication lacks that immediate feedback that we would normally get easily and simply and without even having to think about it consciously through body language. Um, And so uh, when we send each other text-based communications um, and we we type in what we think is a witty joke, and for some reason the other person, maybe they were stupid that day, doesn't get the joke and is instead offended, and then we have to spend five or six emails untangling the mess we've created, then we, we, we live there, the annoyance and the frustration of, of that lack of feedback. The same thing happens on an audio conference. You can hear people's voices, but for reasons which are fairly technical, we could get into, if you like, uh, the, the emotions are not conveyed well through audio conferences. Yeah. Um, and as a result, there's less uh, feedback, which is why, by the way, they're so boring, uh, uh, those audio conferences. And when I ask people, what do you do on audio conferences? And when they're being honest, 100% of people put the, their uh, phone on mute and they go off and take care of email. Mm. And that's when, the, and, and those are the things they're willing to talk about what they're doing. <laughs> yeah. Not all the other ones. Right. And I found some, I, I did research on that and got, got some hilarious responses on 
on uh, what people actually do <laughs> when they should be on audio conferences. But my favorite one, if I can just uh, in, indulge your listeners for a moment, was uh, two, two teams in Brazil. Brazil is a very big country, and these two teams were, were uh, hundreds of miles apart. And uh, they were on a a joint audio conference and one of the uh, one of the teams their locale experienced an earthquake the other team did not know so the the <laughs> the audio conference survived the earthquake it went on unscathed the the <laughs> the people on the audio conference of course on the one half of the audio conference were, conference were long gone but <laughs> they'd run out of the building into the Hilarious. street like supposed to do and nobody noticed on the other end so that that gives you a sense of just how vital and well connected audio conferences are and then the final one video conferencing is a great improvement over audio conferencing because you can see people's faces but there are still technical issues with that that make it less than satisfactory so that's the first big problem is the lack of feedback and and really what we have to do uh, to start to build that feedback back in is to start to become more clear um, in our language about our intent and how we're reacting to what we're hearing and it feels a little strange and clumsy at first, um, but you have to ask yourself the question, how did what I just say make the other person feel? Well, and if you don't know the answer to that question, then you should ask them out loud. Uh, because if you were talking face to face, you would know immediately. You would, could tell by the wince if you said something harsh or the smile if you said something nice. Humans are hardwired to be able to tell how the other person and the other people um, around them are reacting to what they're saying and vice versa. And that's what we lose in all these virtual forms of communication. So starting to build that back in is the, uh, is the first step. Yeah. So that's number actually, one. And when I look at, when I look at something you wrote here in the book that, you know, people need to understand that the brain processes meaning before it processes detail. So, that's you know, right. we want to know why first and then how or what, and we're, and we're missing out on the, uh, on the why we're missing out on, on maybe a bit of the depth. Right. And, and that's a great way to put it, um, if I do say so, because uh, if we don't have the answer to the why, then we're not ready to listen to anything else. Mm. And, and, and that kind of traps, uh, tr trips us up and, and, and we're, we're hung up until we get the answer to that why question. It's always there bugging us. And, and as a result, we don't, uh, we don't listen well to whatever comes next. Mm. And how, so much onus, how, much onus should, how much onus should there be on the recipient of a message to perhaps verbalize I'm, I'm offended by that comment or that makes me sad or I'm really happy you said that or whatever it might be. Again, it might feel a bit clunky and difficult to start with, but it strikes me that you, we need to give that feedback somehow. We need to give what were previously kind of physical cues. Um, we need to give them verbally. That's right. And, and we, we, we are still communicating as if we were communicating the old way. So, uh, and, and so when I say something clever to you and you don't laugh because um, it, it uh, hurts your feelings, let's say, then it's your job rather than just wincing and, f and expecting me to get that through extrasensory perception. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's your job to, to say uh, to me, that hurt my feelings. Mm. Um, and, and that is awkward at first. That's hard to do. It takes great trust. Um, and, it, and so part of the, the, uh, the, uh, the way forward, as I talk about in the book, is for managers and leaders to start to make it possible to create uh, workplaces where people are allowed to talk about these things um, in the virtual space because they're not um, naturally coming through as they would face to face. Mm. Mm. One final question before we move on, Nick. Um, as far as I see, and you, and you, and you had a great example there of the, the team meeting just moving to virtual, um, but it probably covers the same stuff and lasts for about the same amount of time. For me, that doesn't work. And I wonder, did your research cover any or, or come up with anything around how long the best amount of time is to have an audio call because an hour yeah, and a half strikes me as being mental. That's right. It, it's a, uh, it's a, it's an excellent point because uh, we tend to fight the last war as they say of generals. Um, and rather than rethinking what the, the next war should be. And, and this is a perfect example. Virtual meetings are just inherently less interesting because we're getting less emotional and information about other people's intent. And, and so we have to do the work of putting that back in. But also, we just have to make them shorter. And, and so, for example, the standard, as you say, is a 90-minute or an hour-long meeting. 
Mm. Uh, the, the research shows that our attention spans need to be renewed about every 10 minutes or so in the virtual world. Wow. And, and yeah, and, and so that suggests a, a real wholesale changing of the way we think about meetings and what they can accomplish and how we should schedule them. I mean, if you look at schedulers, virtually all our, our uh, online kind of scheduling things schedules in, in hour and half hour increments. So uh, it's still the case of it just makes it that much harder to, to do it. Um, try to try to set up a Google calendar meeting for, for 10 minutes and, and all that you have to work against all the defaults. Mm. It's, it's just crazy. And very, very tiny writing. <laughs> right. Exactly. Um, so tell me a little bit about the second problem, uh, empathy. Yeah. So when you take away the feedback, um, then what happens is we rely on that feedback to know how the other person is feeling. Uh, and when we don't know how the other person is feeling, instead of asking, uh, we just don't care. Uh, <laughs> and so we lose empathy. Um, and of course, there are exceptions and there are nice, sensitive people who do worry about that sort of thing. But on the whole, most of us are moving very fast in the business world. We need to retrain ourselves because when we don't get any information, we tend to assume um, that there's none coming through. Um, and, and of course, people are reacting. We just don't know what that is. Mm. Now, there's a very interesting and dangerous result from this that comes from the way the brain is constructed. It's incredibly important for your uh, uh, listeners to understand is when we don't get information about how the other person is feeling, we, we, uh, attend, we attend tend to assume a very specific thing. And that comes from the way we're hardwired. So imagine uh, our ancestors uh, wandering through the, the jungle or the, or the svelte uh, and, uh, uh, and the, the ones who survived were the ones who were anxious and assumed the worst, assumed that there was a saber-toothed tiger lurking around the next corner. Um, and so as a result, we've evolved to assume that when we don't get specific information to the contrary, that there's danger present or that the other people are angry or that there's something going wrong. And so we tend to assume that silences mean something negative, not just neutral or, or even positive, but something negative. And that's why uh, this second problem is, is, such a, is such a real issue. So when you take away the empathy, then what we get is trolling. And, and that's a new online phenomenon that uh, people decry and they say, where does it come from? And how is it the world has turned so ugly? But it's really not that. It's really just the brain mechanism. You, you take away our ability to understand how you're feeling. And what I assume is that you're angry at me and I'm angry at you. Uh, and the result is, uh, is hostility. Uh, and, and a great increase in the number of ways in which people find fault and break trust and do all the things that come with an assumption of, uh, of negativity. And, and so that's the second big problem with the, with the virtual world. Uh, because our brains are biased toward detecting danger, we imagine hostility. And how do we get around that? Uh, it's very difficult, um, but it involves the same issue of uh, – of uh, expressing our intent. Um, first of all, not assuming. Let's go back to that uh, uh, team audio conference. Um, first of all, not assuming that silence implies people are disinterested <laughs> or, angry, or angry. But then also not letting the silence just go by. Because in that silence then and the lack of response from you, what happens is the listeners also assume danger or hostility. Um, and so the, the, what happens in a series of weekly team meetings in which there are a lot of silences and people don't express how they're feeling is that gradually this, this sort of low-level hostility and, and assumption of ill intent starts to build up. And so you need to actively work to, to combat that. Uh, and, and that's really the first thing you have to do to uh, to make that uh, better is to uh, is to start building back in a positive intent. Mm. And, and and it strikes me that this one and, and the previous one, and I suspect it's maybe a pattern that we'll see through the rest as well. Uh, what they're doing is they're actually putting. If you're trying to convey a message, you're trying to get something across to a team or, or or people in an organization, that actually you're almost with all this, you're starting off in a negative place. So you've got to do a whole load of work to get to almost point zero, 
right. before you can actually start to, to build a, a positive message out to your team. So you've got to do double the work. That's exactly right. And, and you, you have to uh, uh, build in these new behaviors right from the start, because otherwise, uh, to your point, things will very quickly uh, go south, as we say in the United States. Do you say the same thing in Ireland? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Meaning, we meaning not go well. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, so, uh, and the other piece of this, um, first of all, there's the, uh, there's the hostile intent assumption. But the second piece is we hold ourselves um, to a different standard in the virtual world. Um, and by which I mean we hold other people to a different standard in the virtual world. In, in, let me explain what I mean by that. In the face-to-face -face world, um, if you have an old friend, um, if the old friend has an off day, you'll excuse them, you'll forgive them. You'll, you'll understand because you can see the next time you see them that the person is apologetic or obviously hung over or whatever happened. Um, and as a result, we're, we're reasonably tolerant uh, with, uh, uh, with people that we trust in the face-to-face -face world. In the online world, um, we break, the trust is very fragile. And at the first sign of inconsistency, as soon as somebody does something untoward, will break off the connection. Mm. Um, and so the, the, the onus is on the communicator. The onus is on you to be consistent in the, in the virtual world. And that means consistent in the way you communicate, in the style of communication, in the ethics of your communication. As soon as you slip up, the other person is going to cut you off. And, and a very simple way to think about this is is to think about the Amazon versus everybody else uh, problem when you're doing uh, retail online shopping. Um, Amazon, is, by virtue of pouring tons and tons of money in it over many years, has made a very successful uh, retail online uh, shopping experience. Almost any other website, if it when you go to shop there, if you have an experience that's just a little worse than Amazon, what are you going to do? You're going to go to Amazon and try to find it there. Yeah, definitely. That's what people do. They don't think, oh, well, maybe that other website was having a bad day. I should go give them a second chance. You know, maybe, maybe it'll be faster this time, or maybe the payment part won't get hung up like it did the first time. No, we don't do that. We just cut them loose and we go to Amazon. And, and so that, that's how the online world works. We're looking for consistency. Um, and if we don't find it, we'll cut off the communication. And for me as well, it's about speed. I think, you know, we, we are so focused now on getting things done and getting them done as quickly as possible that if something goes wrong, and, I, and I'm the same, you know, if I'm looking up something on my phone, if I click on a link in an article or I do something, if it literally doesn't load in five seconds, I stop looking. And I want to go to the next thing because I'm looking for, I'm looking for that almost immediate gratification. Um, I need things to happen quicker. And I think that's shared by a lot of people now. Yeah, that's absolutely right. That's a, a, another thing uh, that I discovered in the research that I talk about in the book. That, um, the promises of the virtual world uh, were, um, anybody who's old enough to remember this will resonate with this, that um, they, they promised us friction-free um, communication, and they delivered on that, but there was an unintended consequence. Um, and then they promised us what was called asynchronous communication, and that was supposed to be a great benefit too, but something else happened instead. And so friction-free means it's just cheap and easy to send. Oh. Uh, and so com contrast the, 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 the snail mail uh, letter that you had to uh, write out by hand or type out and then put it in an envelope and put a stamp on it and take it to the post. And it's just a huge production, right? Now, email, it's instant. But the unintended consequence was, is now we're being completely overwhelmed with information. Oh. Um, and the asynchronous part is even subtler and more insidious in a way. They promised us that we could send somebody an email in the evening just as we were knocking off work. And they could read it at their convenience 10 o'clock the next morning when they checked in or when it, they'd had their morning coffee and, and got through their first round of work and were ready to think about things. Um, and that was the way it was supposed to work. Instead, what we get is 24-7 communication. And now you'll notice that to your point, if we don't hear from people right away, we'll send them a second email, that lovely passive aggressive email, which says, did, did perhaps my email got stuck in your spam folder? Would you mind checking your spam folder? Uh, I mean, the logic of that is, is uh, hilarious because if the first one got stuck in the spam folder, chances are the second one will too, but never mind. That's what we do because we're, we're in such a hurry. We've all become expert skimmers 
just because we've had to because of this enormous increase in uh, in the, just the sheer amount of communication. Um, and the problem with skimming, of course, is that it, it increases inaccuracies, increases misreading, it increases once again potential hostility. Mm, yeah, it's it's interesting on the whole uh, the whole immediacy thing. I, I have a thirteen year old daughter who'll send me a WhatsApp message, and if I don't respond literally within about eight seconds. I get a question mark. If I don't respond to that question mark in eight seconds, I get a hundred question marks. So <laughs> I, know exa- I know exactly how that feels. I know exactly yeah. how that feels. Um, yeah. The third problem in the book was, was a lack of control over your own persona. Um, you told an interesting story about a CEO who wants to get rid of his reviews on Glassdoor. Yes, and this is, this is a little different from the other problems, uh, but it's, it's a very real one that turned up as I was doing my research in, in the virtual world. And that is everybody's familiar with the the Facebook problem. That is, especially everybody under say fifty. If you if if you uh, had a a wild uh, party as a as a college student um, and then went and applied for your first job and and were, you'd be horrified to discover that those pictures that you posted on Facebook, which seemed so clever at the time, are now uh, are now part of your job application because the uh, the interviewer had the had the uh, the uh, insight to type into Facebook to see if your name came up. All right. So everybody's Googling you. Everybody's checking you out online. Um, and it's very hard to control um, uh, what's out there about you because everything you've ever said, everything you've ever put out there online is there. Machines never forget. People do. And that's why the internet really isn't good for people. It's good for machines. It's not good for people. Um, and so you, you to control that uh, is very difficult, and, and th- you alluded to uh, the CEO I was I was uh, talking about. Um, he is a, a very tough individual, very passionate, driven to succeed, um, and and he drives his people very hard, um, and he also cuts them loose when he doesn't think they're they're uh, making the grade, and um, he did that to a whole team uh, within his organization, um, and so when. When they were fired, they went out and, and wrote nasty things about him on Glassdoor, which is a, if your listeners haven't heard of it, is a, it, it is a website devoted to people talking about confidentially about or anonymous, anonymously about organizations that they've worked at or that they, sure. they continue to work at. Um, and he, so he called me up and he said, uh, Nick, how do you get this stuff off Glassdoor? <laughs> I said, you can't. It's yeah. there forever. The only thing you can do is drown out the bad news with the good. And and so when I talk about taking control of your persona in the book, that's the first thing you have to do. You have to take active measures to, to present to the world the way you would like to be presented and ensure that that drowns out the potential negative things that have got out there. And if you know there's something negative out there about you, then you have to work twice as hard. Uh, so... Uh, that's that's the nature of playing in the in the digital sandbox Mm -hmm. there was a there was a lovely analogy used about um footprints in cement um which which was which i think matched that really nicely yeah if if uh, imagine if uh, every footstep you ever took uh walking around your uh, the town you live in uh, cement was wet uh, and and so every step you took was memorialized forever as soon as you lifted your foot up then the cement dried (laughs) that's the way it is online. Everything is, is remembered forever. And that's terrible for human beings. We are inconsistent. We are imperfect. Uh, we need to be able to forgive each other. And the problem with the online world is it's not that set up that way. It's no, set up not. to remember everything. Yeah. And, and uh, people can Google you. What's going to show up is, is what's of interest. And of, course, and of course, machines don't drink beer which is the one thing that we do, which makes us uh, cause many of these mistakes that come back to bite us on the bum later in life. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Talk to me a little bit about the fourth problem there, lack of emotion. Yeah, so um, when you take out the uh, feedback um, and, and the resulting uh, lack of empathy, uh, what's happening there is um, the emotional subtext of a conversation that you have, say, with back to that audio conference, your regular uh, weekly team meeting, the emotional subtext, which is so easily there when you're face to face, isn't coming through naturally and simply. Mm. And the unexpected uh, consequence of this, and the unintended consequence of this, is that 
um, it's hard to make good decisions. When I, when I tell people about this, they're really surprised because most of us has, have this model of decision-making in our head that it's like uh, Captain Kirk and Mr. Spock. Um, and Mr. Spock is the logical one uh, from Star Trek, for those of you who remember. Um, and he was supposed to be the one who could make good decisions because he didn't make them based on emotion. But it, it actually turns out that the way, the way humans make emotion uh, make make decisions. Sorry, is with emotion, um, and that's our the way our brains are constructed. And if you take away the emotion, we can't make decisions. There's a famous medical patient who's identified by his initials H M. He had a stroke which incapacitated um, the emotional part, the amygdala, uh, the part of his brain, um, and the hippocampus. Um, and as a result, he didn't have a, he couldn't apply emotions to the things that were going on around him. And as a further result, he became unable to decide anything. And you ask, why would this be the case? It's because we use emotions to tell us how important things are to ourselves. A very simple example, and this will make it uh, trivial for your audience to understand. Um, Imagine you're two years old, you wander into the kitchen, and there's this lovely glowing orange ring, just about the level of a stove. And you go out and you put your finger on it because you're curious. And at that age, you touch everything you're curious about. Well, what happens? Your finger gets horribly burned. You react with rage and and pain and grief and anger and tears and you scream and you yell and you learn never to put your finger on a hot stove again. The reason you remember that is because you attach an enormous amount of emotion to that uh, negative emotion in this case uh, to, to that little incident. And that is basically our model for decision making. That's how we decide uh, whether to, to buy things, to fall in love, to take a job, to quit a job, um, to vote for a candidate or not. We attach emotion to all the little vignettes and stories and experiences that we've had, and we uh, rank them according to the amount of emotion we attach to them. And the more important it is, the more emotional it is for us. And, and so we decide on those, uh, on those uh, criteria. I remember, well, being, I remember being at an event a little while ago, and the, uh, the one of the main, one of the keynote speakers, whose speech you probably wrote, uh, I guess, said, um, "You know, we think that we're making rational decisions. We tell ourselves we're making a decision from our head, but actually, we're making decisions emotionally all the time. And actually, what we're doing, the rational brain is simply post-rationalizing." The purchase in in the case of, of this example they gave at the conference it was a lady who bought a pair of boots in milan for 1200 euros um she bought them it was gut feel but then she post rationalized the whole thing in a very rational manner these boots will go with these outfits their outfits i've worn for ages that'll save me having to buy new outfits they're very good quality i'll be able to wear them for a long time so that whole idea that we're making decisions rationally is just nonsense i think to support your point it's all about emotion yes i wish it were otherwise and people will resist that this yeah. is hard for this is hard for uh, your people to accept, uh, and they really argue with me about it. But the neuroscience is clear. Uh, we decide things in our unconscious minds. We decide them based on emotions, and then, to your point, uh, when they rise to the level of the conscious mind and we become aware of them, then what we do is we rationalize the decisions. We say, "Well, I decided that um, because." Uh, yeah, it was a good value or these, these boots will last a long time or whatever the particular uh, need is. And it's, it's easier to, your example is a good one because it's easier to say, yeah, sure, I get that with, with uh, buying a pair of shoes. Um, but we resist when it, when it comes to bigger, deeper, more important things. And we, we still want to say, no, those, I, those have good reasons for them. And I've thought through the reasons and I've made a rational decision. No, sorry. <laughs> in every example, uh, the neuroscience is absolutely clear. Uh, we make decisions based on emotion. And so the point is in the, in the uh, virtual world, when you take out the emotions, two things happen. First of all, they become boring. We don't care because it doesn't rate on our scale of interest, right? It, it's not as interesting as putting your finger on a hot stove. That's interesting um, because the results are so extraordinary, right? The the virtual communications doesn't hurt. Also doesn't feel good. So um, you take out the emotional subtext. First of all, we don't care. And then second of all, in a context in which we don't care as much and which we don't have good emotional valences for knowing how important something is, we actually make poor decisions. And so the, that online team meeting is a, is a setup is a, a way to establish 
that team to start making a series of bad decisions. And, and that's very hard for, um, for businesses to accept because, of course, we're stuck with the virtual world. Um, but uh, we have to learn a new language of intent. We have to start getting clear about sharing our intent uh, with people um, in the business world so that we can put the emotional subtext back in um, and start making better decisions virtually. And as, and as we discussed earlier on, is it a case of simply having to verbalize the, the version of verbalize the emotional impact of the someone has just had on you on a call or, or verbalizing the emotion of how you're feeling? Is it about having to say, you know, literally, uh, you know, I, I'm, 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 I'm rolling my eyes at what you just said. <laughs> yes. That's so we exactly have to right. verbalize our emotions now. Is that, is that the way forward? Yep. That's the way forward. Um, uh, I call it the language of intent, which may be a little easier to accept. We have to make clear our intent. And it's not always just about negative emotions. We, of course, we focus on those because those are the fun ones. But it's about being clear about intent. My intent in, dis- in discussing this proposal with you is that I think this will happen, which will be good for the business. Here are the d- possible downsides. But overall, I think it's a net positive. This is why I think we should do that. It's about getting very clear about what our intent is in each situation, because otherwise people will assume, back to our uh, first problem, people will assume um, negative intent. Okay, interesting. So the very last one here, and I'm actually going to pull, um, I I pulled a paragraph from the book um, just by by way of a little introduction to the last problem. Um, The last big problem is the lack of connection and commitment. Humans crave connection, and the virtual world seems endlessly social, but real connection, like decision-making, is based on emotions. Take the emotions out, and we feel alone more often than makes sense. As somebody that works in internal communications, and as somebody that consults with organizations on communications, the whole idea of taking communications out, for me, is terrifying, because what I'm telling them is, put more emotions in. Make it more emotional. Talk about your feelings. Talk about how that made you feel. Put more in. And what's happening here is that the, the virtual world seems to be sucking it out. That lack of connection is going. Yeah, that's exactly right. And as I said earlier, it as a result, the connections are much more fragile and easily broken. And that's terrifying too. Um, and the 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 first uh, solution to that, let's get to the solutions because I know uh, – by now having talked about this with a number of people um, that your listeners are getting anxious and they're, and they're, and they're saying, how do we fix this? Yeah. Um, the, the, the first and most important thing, uh, and, and this will not surprise you, is that we have to become better storytellers. Mm. And stories, as you know, good stories have emotion and conflict and, and, and uh, interest in them in a way that just talking data or just talking facts doesn't. Um, and, the way to engage people online is to tell better stories. Um, And we, we see this over and over again in the United States. um, As, as some of your uh, listeners may be aware, we're already launching the next uh, presidential campaign uh, season and, and perhaps sensing opportunity. We have more Democrats running for president. We believe than ever in history a little hard to be sure about that, but well, there's this huge number of, of Democratic opponents, potential opponents to uh, current President Trump. Um, and they're all fascinating people, and they've all had their official launches, and I'm sure there's more to come. Um, but the one that got the, uh, the most uh, play was our uh, uh, fe- uh, fellow uh, who ran for Senate and lost, Mr. Beto. Um, and what he does is he involves his listeners in the story of him deciding and then committing to run for president in a way that the others haven't done as strongly. And as a result, he set a record for first 24 hours of after you announce for president fundraising. He raised more money in the first 24 hours than anybody has ever raised in history. Wow. And he has the knack, maybe because he's just younger and he gets living in the virtual world, but he has the knack for, for involving people in his story. And, and he does something which is really extraordinary for presidential candidates too, which is he talks about his doubts and his indecisions and, and he admits that he makes mistakes and he he changes his mind. And of course, these are the things that make good stories and make us fascinating to each other. But, 
something very foreign for a presidential candidate. They want to come out of the box as if they were perfect, never made a, a bad decision in their lives, and they're ready to be the leader of the free world and so on and so forth. Um, and so this is a new kind of storytelling for a mm. presidential candidate, and yet it's already working. And vulnerability is a very powerful thing. Vulnerability is huge in the, in the online world because it's the essence of beginning of a story. You have to be vulnerable to tell a story. Mm. Um, invulnerable people don't make for very interesting stories. Uh, and so uh, this uh, can't potential candidate, Beto, has figured this out. Uh, and the others will see whether they catch up or not. Mm. Mm. Interesting. What else? What are some of the other ways that people can combat these things in the online world? Well, as I start, as I say, with uh, um, asking yourself the question, how did what I just say make you feel? Um, and, and of course, the inverse of that, which is how does what you just say make me feel? Um, the, the one simple way you can begin to put that into these audio conferences that we've repeatedly uh, alluded to, uh, for example, is to use a simple code uh, at the beginning and end to allow people to say how they are. Um, and it's up to the leader to pick whatever code they like. I suggest um, using the stoplight analogy. So uh, red means you're having a terrible, awful, disastrous day and you probably shouldn't be on the call. Yellow means just sort of normal stress at this god awful place that I work in. Just kidding. Um, and green, green means things are good and great. Um, and so let's get, get on with it. And that allows people in a fairly safe way to say how you are at the beginning of the call and then how you are at the end of the call. And um, there are a couple of companies that are uh, developing uh, this kind of audio and video uh, uh, software that helps with this, and they will keep track of those kind of things. And so you can actually keep track of that over time, which is a really interesting bit of data to find out how is your team doing over six months or a year if you do that check in regularly, uh, because um, it might lurk in the back of your mind, hey, Jimmy over there in, uh, in, in Dubai is, it seems like he's always uh, yellow. Maybe I should check in with him. But this will give you the actual facts to know whether, uh, whether that's accurate or that's just your skewed perception of it. So, so th some kind of uh, simple code like that, you can use some numbers. How do you feel on a scale of five or one is excellent and five is poor? Uh, whatever works for you. Uh, but uh, the idea is to start building in simple ways for people to check in because it's hard to do that. And, and most of us have experienced on those audio conferences. Um, the, the first five minutes of an audio conference goes something like this. You hear the beep, you go, Oh, somebody just checked in. Who's that? Oh, it's Jim from Dubai. Jim, how you doing? Jim starts to say, well, I'm actually beep. Oh, who's that? Oh, that's, uh, uh, uh Jane from, uh, from Singapore. Jane, how you doing? Well, it's pretty good here. It's hot in Singapore. Beep. Who's that? And you get this sort of idiotic, half broken conversations that go on for five to seven minutes as people beep in um, onto the call, right? So this does away with all that. You wait till everybody's on and then you say quickly, give us your check-in. Um, and so that's just a simple practical thing um, to, uh, to make that better. Another thing I uh, urge people to do, and this is much easier for the millennials to do than older people. Um, and that is to start using emojis and emoticons in your written text. We haven't talked about the written uh, text as much, but uh, that's a huge area, as we all know, for misunderstandings and, and for mistaking of tone. And especially as we have to handle more and more email, the research shows our emails get shorter and shorter. And of course, the shorter they are, the more likely they are to be misunderstood. Um, and I've asked this of, uh, of leaders as I started to talk about the book. Um, I've asked, I'll ask people, how many of you are in charge of a team? And, They'll raise their hand and I'll say, have you ever sent out an email, the following email, two words, great job. And what's interesting is virtually a hundred percent of leaders have sent out that email at one time or another. Great job. And I say to them, what did you mean by that? And they look at me like I'm crazy. They say, well, I meant they did a great job, whoever it was. And I say, how do you imagine your recipient read that? And they'll say, well, I would assume that they read it as a, I thought they'd done a good job. It turns out that if you send as a leader the, the two word email to your, uh, to one of your teammates, great job. The assumption is that you're being sarcastic and it throws that recipient into an hours long self doubt, recrimination, anger, 
brain spin about what, what happened here? What do I need to do to fix this? It, I mean, and, and I tell this to leaders, the research shows this clearly. I tell this, leaders, they just look at me, they, they have no idea. But that's the result of, uh, uh, of the increased speed and the increased number um, and the result of having to handle more and more email. And so putting in emojis or emoticons is a quick way to, uh, to start to untangle that. And just get over your sort of squeamishness about them and, and your feelings that they're kind of trivial or childish or something. Absolutely. If, you say great, if you say great job and put a smiley face on, there's no doubt that you mean that you thought the guy did a great job. If you put yeah. a great job and a frowny face, then they're going to assume that you meant it sarcastically. So mm. it, it's just a way of straightening that out. Yeah. So what people think is a game or a toy or for children can actually be extremely powerful in the online world. Yeah. We're putting in there the body language, mm. uh, at least in the emotion, in the emoticon uh, the, of the face, uh, uh, let's say uh, we're putting in the body language that the virtual world takes out. It's as simple as that. Very interesting. Very, very interesting. Listen, conscious of time, Nick, um, very last question. Um, and this is one that I ask everyone that comes on the podcast that I will at some point, I think we're 25 episodes in now, I will at some point do a compendium of these answers um, in, in a podcast episode itself. But what's the one piece of advice you'd have given your 20 year old self knowing what you know now? What would you have done differently? Uh, it's a great question. And I would say uh, when you're 20, you're worried very much about the immediate. You're worried about finding a job and getting a job and getting established and making a name for yourself and all those things. I'm, I'm thinking in business terms. Mm. And I would have said, I would say to my 20 year old self, worry less about that um, and more about um, finding the work that's worth doing for you. Um, and, and by the, that, I mean, uh, uh, finding the work that really um, that you can do well and that the world needs, but also float your boat. Um, and we tend to, uh, and I talk to many people who do this, they, we tend to go in a way that feels appropriate or right um, because there's a tried and true job path there. Uh, oh. And uh, uh, I think the more interesting jobs are to, they're harder to establish, but they're to be found in, uh, in uh, the, in, not in the traditional paths, but in, in paths that haven't been made yet. Well, as Robert Frost said, take the path less trodden. Exactly. Well, very good. Nick, it's been a real pleasure talking to you. I'm conscious that you're probably standing there surrounded by packing crates that you're yet to unpack, having just moved house. Um, but uh, I really, really appreciate you having taken the time today. Really interesting. Um, the book is available, I know, on Amazon. I got it on the Kindle. Um, I'm sure it's available in bookstores as well really interesting read and, and well worth picking up for people that work work in communications or in fact have to communicate as part of the role which i guess is all of us in many ways um so thank you um really appreciate it i've enjoyed the chat and that's been it's been good talking to you uh, scott it's a great pleasure and um, uh, yes let's all keep uh, getting more clear about our intent um, and our emotions Absolutely. can only be good have a great day thank you Thanks for listening. If you enjoyed this podcast, please take a minute to rate it and maybe even leave a comment. To learn more about Inspiring Change, to read our blog, and to hear more podcasts, please visit our website at inspiringchange.ie.